Well, thanks for joining us over lunch, everybody. Um, we are doing kind of some more lunch and learns, just trying to bring more information to the masses. And I am going to turn it over to Ali Schreyer, who's here to lead this talk. She just did a talk for our whole staff as well, which was very valuable. So we're excited to have her. And um, we will go ahead and take it from here, Allie. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Gold Crown. Um, I am happy to be here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Allie Schreyer, and I am the founder of um, Schreyer Counseling and Consulting, which is a private practice here in Colorado that treats kids and families um, for therapy and with um, for any kind of mental health challenges or transitions and tricky things that people face. And then I also am the founder and executive director of Mental Scope Consulting, which also is about mental health, of course, um, but thinks about applying those same principles to a corporate setting or a work setting. And so with that today, I am so excited to chat for a few minutes and there will absolutely be time for questions about empowering capable kids. So to just start us off, when I think about kids, I really think about thriving kids and that this is really what most of us strive for as parents and coaches and teachers and quite honestly, even with our non-biological kids, it feels good to see kids thrive and do well. But the question begs over and over and over again of how do we get there? What do we do to get thriving kids and to empower them to do well, and to feel good physically and mentally and emotionally and all the different pieces. And so my focus today is really thinking on what do we know from the research and from, um, from therapy and from therapeutic principles? What do we know? What does all the evidence say about helping kids thrive? And what can we do as the adults in their lives to help them get there? So I'm gonna kind of frame it on three pieces that I wanna use as the takeaways for today. And the first is that failure is your friend. So this idea is really critical to the kids and their self-efficacy, that if we want kids to be thriving, we have to let them fail. And that is such a hard thing as people who want to help and support kids. It is hard to see anybody fail. It is hard to see the Nuggets fail the first two games, right? So it's even harder to see kids who are struggling and not doing well, or that they try out for a sports team and they don't make it, or they study for that math test and it doesn't get them where they want to be. That is not an easy thing. But just like Michael Jordan, right, who says, I know fear is an obstacle for some people, but it's an illusion to me. Failure always made me try harder next time. And that's essentially what we're going to ask you to do as the grownups and the adults in these kids' lives is to start framing failure as a friend and saying to our kids, when they fall down, when they don't make the team, what does that mean for them? It's called a meta message. And we're looking for what's the big message. It's not about the soccer team or the basketball team or your math test. It's the big message that's involved in kind of understanding what's happening. And so one of the things that you can do is starting to embrace when people fail, including yourself. So I use myself as an example all the time with the kids that I work with and the families I work with, and absolutely with my own kids as well, of, gosh, I really messed up today, right? Or I was playing in that tennis match and I bombed at the end, and I can't believe that I totally let my team down and we you know, lost the match, whatever it may be. But those same principles are really helpful to hear from other people, especially from adults, that this is not unique to kids. You're not failing because you're a child or because you're a teenager. You are failing because that's part of the human experience. And what do you get out of failing? That's that meta message. What do you get? What can I take from this experience? And so I would ask you to start even saying to these kids and to these teens, what did you get out of it? What did you learn out of it? What are you going to do differently next time? And start to frame it in kind of this positive growth mindset, which you've probably heard a lot about. Schools use that a lot, but in a growth mindset mentality. So with this, one of the things that I talk with parents and caregivers about often is what I call snowplow parenting. Now, I didn't coin the term. I wish I did. I'm not even sure who did. 
Um, but the idea of snowplow parenting is that it's a parent or a caregiver who essentially is trying to clear the path of any adversity and any challenges that come for a child or for a teen or for you know a young adult. And so when I was growing up, there were um, helicopter parents, right? They would hover, they would kind of look over things, but they wouldn't intervene as much. They just kind of watched and observed. And what we've seen in recent years is that it has changed and evolved into snowplow parents who are really trying to clear all the adversity out of the way. And they're trying to provide this environment that is situated without any failure, without any challenges, and is really set up for quote unquote success. The challenge with this, if we go back to failure is your friend, the challenge is that failure is your friend. And that when somebody clears that path for you, the unintended message you're sending to those kids and teens is that they are incapable of dealing with those shortcomings. They are incapable of dealing with failure, which is not the truth. So if we want to empower our capable kids, we need to start thinking of ourselves, maybe even not even as a, as a helicopter parent, but certainly not as a snowplow parent or not as a snowplow caregiver and thinking that failure is really your friend and how are you gonna frame that up in a way that helps them grow and move through it. There recently was a book that came out um, and it's called The Anxious Generation. It is a fantastic read that highlights a lot of the principles that I'm talking about today, but um, also some of these things around how do we let our kids fail and how do we help them to become capable. The second thing that I'm gonna leave you with is that we want to build their confidence. Of course, right? I'm not saying anything new here, but the question that families ask me is how? How do I build up my kids' confidence? How do I help them with their self-esteem? So here's four ways to do that that I'm gonna talk through briefly. The first is that we want them to have freedom in small steps. So for this, what I'm thinking is, it's almost like when you are learning to swim. You don't throw your infant toddler into the deep end. Most of us don't, right? Instead, we start by holding them and we're kind of like getting their feet wet and we drip water on their head and we take these small steps to let them know that they can do this. That is the same idea here for building confidence, whether that is with doing a writing assignment or a robotics project or when you're talking about sports, it doesn't matter what it is. But we want to give them these, this, these small steps of freedom so that they can start to build their confidence. And what we do on the back end then is that we congratulate them and we encourage them with our words. So for example, if somebody was working on a robotics project and it was really challenging and we were like, all right, well, you have to use this tool that is really dangerous for you to use, but I'm going to first teach you to do it and I'm going to let you try and then you say to them like, wow, you really listened there. I love that you were paying attention to what I said. I like that you kept your fingers out of the way, right? And so now I'm gonna let go and I'm gonna watch, but I'm gonna stand right there. And I wanna see if you can do it. If it feels uncomfortable, stop, I'm right here. Wow, I can see that you can do that by yourself and that you were focused and that you were paying attention and taking it seriously, right? We start to build their confidence by letting that rope out a little bit longer and helping them do the things on their own. The second piece is that we want to acknowledge um, their feelings coupled with instilling confidence. So this is what Dr. Eli Leibowitz calls the mac and cheese. And he is a researcher um, out of Yale University and he's written a ton of books on anxiety. And one of the things that he talks about is the mac and cheese. To make it really good, you need the mac and the cheese. You have to have both ingredients for it to taste good. That's the same when we think about confidence for our kids. We want to acknowledge their feelings, possibly even their fear, and then we couple that with confidence. So what it sounds like is, I know that you are really scared to go off the dining board. I can see that you're really worried about doing that. And I have all the confidence in the world that you can do it. So we understand, we empathize, and we sympathize, and we acknowledge their feelings. So we name that first, right? I can see that this is hard for you, or I can appreciate you don't want to go to school today. I know that it's hard that the kids made fun of you yesterday, and that feels really bad for you. And we couple it with an and. And 
I know that you can get through your day today, even with those kids at school. And I know that you can go off that, that diving board and I'm proud of you for trying. And I have all the confidence in the world that you can take that math test. So if you can build the mac and cheese, that will absolutely help to instill confidence while not negating their feelings, helping them still feel heard and understood for how they feel, but also encouraging them to stick with it even if it's hard. The next is naming the effort and not the outcome. So for example, if we wanna build their confidence, I keep going to math for whatever reason today, but if we wanna build their, their confidence with math, right? We are going to name like, I noticed how hard you tried. I noticed that you practiced your math facts. I noticed that you went to tutoring and you talked to your teacher about things, right? I am really impressed by, or I'm proud by, what are you proud of? Even if they got a D, right? That it's the effort and the grit and the gumption that it takes to do something. And that builds their confidence that even if the outcome is yuck, it still helps them come back to do it again. And the last one is finding an area of success. Find something that they are good at. It does not have to be basketball. It does not have to be soccer. It doesn't have to be math. It can be something really small. Maybe they're really good at helping to take care of their siblings. Maybe they're really good at picking up the house. Maybe they're really good at thinking of others or cooking or any of the things in life that we need to be good at. So find something that is their thing, uniquely theirs, piano, coloring, anything. It doesn't matter what it is and help instill that that is a gift and that is something that they have that makes them unique. If you feel like you are one in a zillion, then you can feel really comfortable and confident in who you are because you have a very special skill. But if you feel like you are less than everybody else or just trying to keep up, that absolutely can hurt your confidence. Find something, even if it's kindness, find something that they excel at and say that and name it over and over again until it becomes their own internal narrative. The last piece here is struggling well. So the idea of struggling well is that we want to accept, we have acceptance instead of avoidance when struggle occurs and it helps to normalize difficulties and build self-efficacy. So if you have ever climbed a mountain, especially in Colorado, climbed a 14er, right? You know that struggling is part of the journey. It is not always easy. Sometimes it's muddy or the rock slide or it's just plain hard. But that doesn't mean that you don't get a payout and a reward when you get to the top. You feel proud. You feel excited, right? There's lots of positive emotions that come from doing something hard. And one of the best things that we can do is to help empower our kids, is to help them struggle well. So it's a little bit different than failing, right? It's like when you're right in the middle of the storm. And we say something like, gosh, this is really hard. It won't be easy, but we can do hard things. There's two things that we say just in that phrase. I gave it to you here in case you need like a go-to. Um, but I use the word we, that we can do hard things, not you. That we are in this together. When somebody is struggling, oftentimes it feels isolating and alone, whether they're struggling with mental health or they're struggling with, you know, basketball or a science experiment or whatever it may be. It feels like I'm the only one. So using we language can be really helpful in supporting this idea of struggling well, right? And it also, the second thing it does is it normalizes the difficulties. This is not unique to you. Everybody struggles. Everybody has hard times. Everybody has things that they have to overcome and face. So maybe it's a medical diagnosis, or maybe it's moving homes, or maybe it's a parent's divorce, or maybe it's not making the team, whatever it is, that these things, we can struggle together, and that in struggling together, we can get through it stronger. So I want to encourage you to think about how can you help somebody, a, a kid or a teenager struggle in a way that then helps them to get up that mountain and to push that boulder up the hill and to feel more confident in who they are. And if we can do that, then we see that self-esteem boost on the back end. 
we see that proud nature really kind of come through. So when I'm working with families and I'm working with kids and I'm talking about struggle, uh, for example, there was somebody I was working with that had a learning disability and the struggle continued and it was just hard. School was really hard for this kid and the family was frustrated and they were doing all these accommodations at school and it wasn't helping. And so then the parents wanted to do more and more accommodations. And what happened was when we do too many, in that example, we might need some very real accommodations, but when we do too many and it kind of looks like snowplow parenting, that there should be, you know, all the exceptions and nothing should be done to help this, or I'm sorry, everything should be done to help this kid. We are teaching them again that they can't do it, which is really challenging to undo that narrative. So instead we wanna say, we wanna build in all the supports that we can. We are in this with you. We are your team. We are gonna get through this together. I'm on the bench until you call me up. And when you say, get out there and get going, I'm ready because I am in your corner. And sometimes I need to take a seat on the bench because I can see that you can do this too. That can really help them feel empowered to take control of their own lives, which is ultimately what we want our kids to be able to do. So with that, I know we have a little time, but I wanna go ahead and open it up for questions and answers. Um, and I need to monitor the chat so people can talk out loud or you can um, type a question if you'd like to type a question, whatever is comfortable for you. Does anybody have something to start with? So somebody just typed me a question. Um, how do you help your child to struggle well when they're, I'm trying to hang on, how do I help their child to struggle well when somebody else is not helping their child to do that? Huh, okay. So I think what that means, um, and somebody can chime in if I'm wrong here, but essentially like what if your friends maybe are not in the same boat is kind of how I'm reading that. So how can you help your child maybe if the people around them are not doing the same things that you are? I would say it if that's the question, you kind of end up um, creating a movement and creating a wave. So in a similar way of like what you do with technology, right? If your kid doesn't have the phone, it starts to then trickle down and other kids may not have phones or parents look to you and they're wondering what you're doing. I would say the same thing is true when it comes to some of these principles of how do you empower your kids? How do you help them? Well, one of the things that you do is whether it's that you see failures as a friend or they're struggling well, right? All these pieces that when you start to say those things over and over again, one, we want this narrative to become true for our kids and our teens. And two, then other parents and other people in the community are also looking to you. So I would say stick with it. Um, even if it's maybe against the norm of the people that your kids hang out with or the parents or the caregivers that are around your kid, this is not just me talking, this is decades of research talking. And so we know that these are the things that help kids thrive and do well. So I would stick with it, even if it is a little bit against the grain in whatever situation you're in. Um, it's a couple more in the chat. I see a few. Aren't some of these things different for different ages? Great question. By, by and large, no. Um, so what they do look like, the scaffolding of what struggle looks like does look different per age. So if you have a five or six-year-old, for example, I'm not going to have them struggle with reading you know, to the same degree maybe or like reading something on their own because they're just learning to read. Versus maybe somebody is capable of reading and they just don't want to when they're 9, 10, 11 years old. They're like, no, can you just read to me, right? I might say you read for a few minutes first and then I can read because I know that you can do it. I know that you're tired and I can appreciate that you're really tired tonight, bud. And I know that you're a really good reader and I'm confident that you can do it. So it's kind of a simple example, but I would say the same three principles are absolutely true no matter what the age but I would tailor them a little bit differently depending on the age. 
Um, so if that person has a specific question about a certain age group, I'm happy to answer that as well. Um, are we parents still not trying to use the term good job? Is there, there an alternative? Great question. So um, <laughs> that was like, I feel like a few years ago, it was like, don't say good job, right? We can say good job, but it's more effective if you say good job for what? Or most effective would be if you kind of congratulate the effort. So if I'm going to say like, hey, good job today, sometimes it just comes out, right? It comes out of my mouth too. You're like, you did great, way to go. And then you go, good job for trying your best. Good job for passing the ball. Good job for studying really hard, right? So if you can tailor it, maybe even after the fact, if you're like me, it comes out and then you're like, oh yeah, good job for right? And make it effort-based rather than outcome-based. That's kind of the best thing that you can say. Um, so you can still use that as a starter if that's kind of already in, internal for you and already what you're doing. Um, is there an age where girls need most help? Ooh, hard question um, and subjective. So what we know from the research um, is that it is a little bit mixed. Part of that is because there's the environmental factors that a couple with that. So depending on what a, I'm gonna say a girl for this situation, but what a girl's um, like family life and support system looks like, what their school environment looks like, um, are they kind of on grade level, so to speak, cognitively, right? Can they, are they where they're supposed to be there? Um, do they have any developmental delays? Those kind of things. So there's not a clear answer. What we do know is that socially, the social kind of piece of girls, that junior high, early junior high, really 12, 13, 14, um, is when we start to see more mental health challenges with girls. Um, actually, The Anxious Generation talks about this a little bit, that book that I just referenced, and he says that it can even start a little bit earlier than that from his research. So I wouldn't say that there's an age that they need more help, but we know that mental health wise, girls tend to be right around junior high age where they start to see themselves versus their peers in a little bit of a way that can sometimes be challenging, but there's not a clear answer on that. Um, I echo with that concern too. I've tried this and struggled against my own co-coaches and the kids' parents. I try to struggle well myself in that regard. That's a great point, right? It is hard. Um, whether you're going up against coaches or parents or whoever it may be, it absolutely is hard. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I do the same thing. I just model it, right? I try to struggle well too. And quite honestly, sometimes I don't struggle well and I just struggle. And then I name that as well because that's a part of the human experience. And I don't want my kids or any kids to think that that's not, right? And so sometimes like if my struggle is more of a failure than it is just a struggle, I absolutely own that as well. How do you help a child that is afraid of being uncomfortable and avoids uncomfortable situations at all costs, even if it means missing, missing social situations and activities they like? Great question. Um, so, to me, if I put on my clinical hat, since I'm a therapist, uh, without knowing this child, I would be wondering if anxiety is at play. I don't know. Um, but that would be one of my first wonderings. And if there is anxiety, maybe it's social anxiety and they're worried about doing things. Um, maybe it's a fear, a fear of failure. Maybe they're just really worried about being embarrassed around peers, potentially, whatever it is the gold standard of care is to help them face their fears in teeny tiny little ways. So for example, if you have a child that's afraid and avoiding situations, maybe they don't want to go to the park with like a group of kids are there, or maybe you get to the park and there's a lot of kids playing and they decide like, no, I don't want to play. I just want to go home. Right. I would say, well, let's see if we can play for maybe two minutes. Let's just see if we can play. And then I would reward the effort of trying to do something hard. You can also, it's a great place to use the mac and cheese again, to say, I can see that you're a little bit worried, or I know that you're kind of scared, or maybe you're overwhelmed if you know how they're feeling, or I can see like something's going on for you if you don't know what the feeling is. And I am confident that you can enter that room or that you can go to that party 
or that you can play on the playground for two minutes. So we do treat it very similar to all the ways that we would empower any kid. Um, but if there is more going on or they're kind of paralyzed by some of these things, you're welcome to reach out to me if this is a specific example as well. Um, and I'm happy to talk through it with you. But I would be wondering if maybe practicing this even more and more and more or possibly getting some kind of therapeutic support would be helpful for that kiddo. I think we've answered all the questions in the chat. Any other questions from anyone? And you're welcome to like talk out loud as well. Allie, I know you have your um, website on there. Is that the best way for people to find you? If they're interested yes. in seeking more services. Yep, that's the best way to find me. If you're specifically looking for um, therapy from myself or my team, um, there's actually a inquiry form on the homepage of the website. And so that's really fast to send me a little bit of information about what you're looking for. But if you just have email questions and things like that, my email is also on the website. And so you can just send me a note as well. Hopefully that's helpful. Well, thank you. Um, I guess last, last call. Oh, there is. Yes. Somebody asked about sending us the recording. Um, we will be sending it out later this week. So if you, if you missed the beginning of it, um, we'll, we'll send out that link. So. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you everybody for your questions um, and for joining today. And let me know if I can help take care. Thank you.